Okay, so on we go today. We're going to continue in the world of Illustrator. And um, the point today is to learn a bunch about the Pathfinder tools and how you combine shapes together um, and kind of a more complicated way of working with the pen tool. We will, of course, continue working with the pen tool like you did last class um, to create a custom logo. And I think logos are a great place to kind of learn your design process, but also to experiment with Illustrator. They work hand in hand. Remember that a logo should be a vector-based art so that you can make it as large or as small as you need it to be without distorting it. So this is a perfect opportunity to draw something that can be blown up really, really large. Logos are also essential. We're bombarded with them constantly. Um, and there's really something that identifies a brand, or in this case, you. So an effective logo is fundamentally distinctive, something that's easy to recognize, that you, you know without a doubt that that belongs to a particular company or that belongs to a particular individual. They should be appropriate. They should be somehow relevant to whatever, although that one's kind of an interesting one because, uh, well, we'll see a couple examples later on that have nothing to do with their particular brands. Practical, graphic, something that grabs the eye, something that attracts you to it. It's a form of sales in a way. Simple in form. The more complicated they are, the harder they are to reproduce, the harder they are to see. Some of the best logos are really, really simple. Conveys the intended message. So here's a bunch. You flash a bunch up here. Uh, and we're, like I said, we're, we're constantly exposed to these um, over the course of a day. But we learn to recognize them. We learn to really easily, quick, quickly and s easily see a particular logo and know what it represents. Simplicity. There, the logo should be easy to recognize. It should be pretty versatile. Think about it on a small scale, something on a t-shirt, something on a little piece of you know, business card, something on a billboard. Can that logo span all of those sizes and still look good? Is it memorable? Is it something that is easy to recognize? Is it something that you'll remember seeing? Often features something unique unexpected, the more cliche they get, the less likely it is that you're going to remember a particular logo. So I said I would get to a logo that has absolutely nothing to do with what it's selling, but this is one of the most iconic logos that we're, uh, we experience on a daily basis. The Starbucks logo, it's absolutely everywhere. But at the same time, does it have anything to do with coffee? But it's really iconic. It's something that we see and we recognize and we immediately associate it with its coffee. I have a bunch of other examples in here just for the fun of it. They're logos that people have created for fake companies. Um, but they're kind of entertaining to see how you would come up with, with certain companies and what their logos would be. I love this one. It's, it's goofy, but it's memorable. If that was something that you saw on a regular basis, you would really recognize it. Enduring. So you want to make sure we're not following fads or trends. We want to make sure that this is lo some logo that can last. Is it future proof? So does it really matter right now you're in school, you create a personal logo for yourself, you're probably going to change it. I recognize that. That makes sense. But if we're a company and we want that company to be around for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, what's that logo going to look like in 50 years? Is it going to feel dated? Is it going to feel out of touch, or is it going to be something that's relevant? So let's say, for example, that Apple stuck with its first logo ever. This was Apple Computer's first logo. So how would it be if you picked up your phone and this was on the back of it? Be a little bit uh, <laughs> off. off. Yeah. yeah. So it's really important to think about the future of a particular logo. So if we look at Apple, for example, they started with this, and they quickly realized that wasn't the right logo. And so in 1976, they changed the rainbow logo. And rumor had it they were going to change back to the rainbow logo this year, but it didn't end up happening. Um, so 1976 to 1998, they had that same logo. That's a pretty long tenure for a logo. Company almost went belly up. Steve Jobs came back, kind of rebranded, restarted the company, and they switched from the rainbow logo to the pure black, just static Apple logo. The Apple itself has not changed since 1976. That's something for longevity. 
Then they did a little bit of kind of finessing with the logo over time, depending on what the design trends were. So we kept the same logo. Then from 2001 to 2007, things were a little shiny and a little glossy. Um, so we made the Apple logo a little glossy. We, like I had anything to do with it. Uh, the Apple logo was a little glossy. They cut some of that glossiness out and kind of dulled it down from 2007 to about 2013 or so. And then they got rid of all the gloss and they went to their current logo, which is very much like the 1990, um, eight, nine logo when Steve Jobs first came back, where it's just the Apple, and that's it. There's no gloss, it's just flat, etc. But it's interesting to see that transition. That's something, that's a logo that can last, that can end up being there for a long period of time. So when we think about the logo design process, it's very much like the graphic design process. It's very much like the architectural design process. It's very much like the industrial design process. It's a design process. We start with the design brief, what is this logo going to be about? What's the company about? We move into research. Then we do reference. What else is out there? Then we do a bunch of sketching and conceptualization. We try stuff out. We say what looks good, what doesn't look good. Then we reflect on those sketches. And then we finally get to that presentation phase where we're actually presenting it to a particular client. I like this one. Uh, this was by a company called Just Creative Design that they, they, they use the kind of Venn diagram thing where we, we have the overlapping circles to approximate how much time is spent in the various pieces. And so if you look first at the brief and the research, those are pretty small. Reference is very small. It shouldn't take too much time. Then we have the big circle about sketching and conceptualization. Thinking through that design, what's, what's it, what should it look like? What are my ideas? How do we get those ideas out, et cetera? Then we reflect for a small amount of time. Then we go back and have a lot of time doing revisions. So we're working our way through. Finally, we get to the presentation, the delivery, and then they have support in here. That would be future changes, little adjustments, et cetera. So let's start and let's talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. The design brief. You want to question the client about what they're after. If you're designing a logo for somebody, you want to say, what are you looking for in this logo? What's the purpose? Where do you intend to use it? All those are good questions. For today, for our purposes today, you're asking yourself these questions. What do I intend to use this logo for? Be certain, be certain to include where it is to be used. Are you going to use it on letterhead, business card, t-shirts? Where does it belong? That's an important one. It's also a good time to discuss fee or cost. So if you're doing it for somebody else, you can charge uh, you know, a certain fee and you can talk to them about how much that would be. For today's purposes, you're doing it for yourself, so you can charge yourself as big of a fee as you want. You can be a high, high, high expense designer. Then we get into research. So in what industry does this particular logo belong? Well, you guys are all in the design fields, so it would be relevant to look at your design field. If you're in architecture, what are some architecture logos? What do firm logos tend to look like? If you're in industrial design, same thing. You look at those relevant, uh, the, those relevant logos in kind of the same field to get a sense for what seems appropriate. What other logos are used in this industry? What's the history of previous logos? So a lot of you have done logos in, say, 130. You drafted up your logo. You may or may not have been happy with the end result. Do you, do you like it? Do you want to do a digital version of it? Do you want to evolve it? Should it change? Should it, should it evolve a little bit? You can do a lot more in a computer logo than you can by hand drawing it. So you might find a, a little bit of a, a different play on the same logo. What are your competitors using? Has somebody else done a logo that you like? Those are all relevant phases or relevant parts to the research phase. Then we do reference. Look into generally successful designs. What logos are good? What do you think makes a good logo? Those kinds of questions. Google's great. If you Google logos, you can find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of logos. So it's easy to find lots of, uh, of different ideas. And then it kind of helps you get started. What are the current styles or trends in logos? I'm going to show you the current trends uh, in a little bit. There's actually a, a publisher that publishes the current trends in logos every year. And so they'll say, this is, the, this is the current trends and logos for this particular year. Uh, and you can go back and see what those trends were over time. Is it flat? Is it three-dimensional? 
et cetera. I'll show you those examples for, for this year, or it might be 2018. They might be a year behind. Then we get into sketching and conceptualization. Remember, this is that big circle. This is what takes the bulk of your time when it comes to logo design. You're going to develop multiple logo design concepts, explore a variety of ideas. What's working, what's not working. Maybe we throw a little bit of text in there. Maybe we take the text away. Maybe we change colors. All those are good options as we evolve this process. Fall back on your research and reference steps. What else have you seen? What other things are going on in the industry, etc. You produce a bunch of ideas and then you start to work through those ideas. So here's a couple examples. So this one, they started with a photograph of somebody's fist. And they said, okay, well, what does that look like in sketch form? Okay, this is kind of what it looks like. Then they evolved it and kind of clarified it, became more shape-like, distilled it down into more basic shapes. There we go into step three, even a little bit more. Take it into the computer, start working in Illustrator. Start building up that same design concept in Illustrator. A little bit more detail. Try adding a little color. Try adding a little text. What font they chose is very relevant to how this looks, the rounded corners. Different versions. There's the, the colored version. There's the grayscale version. There's the black and white version of the same logo. And then what would it look like on a variety of documents? Business card, letterhead, envelope, etc. So they're playing this out over the course of the design to kind of see how it would work. Another example here, sketching and conceptualization. You don't have to do that in the computer. You can go into, you know, take out a piece of paper and start drawing. Same concept here. Your sketchbook could be filled with these. They're going through and coming up with a variety of different ideas. Getting into the computer, drawing out these curves. These are all pen tool curves. Thinking about what parts should be colored. They're using gradients in this first example that kind of fold over on themselves. Ends up turning out really nice. This is a little bit more three-dimensional because of those gradients. And you can see how the, how the curve is folding. Playing around with different fonts. These all look virtually the same. But there's subtle differences. Which one looks best to be part of that logo? Small adjustments. And then the final logo. I think this is interesting, too, because they thought about what it looks like on a white background, what it would look like if you did it on a black background, and then what about if you had to do it in grayscale? Because these colors wouldn't come out if you were doing a gray copy. They would get really muddled. So what would it look like in grayscale? And I think that's one of the most effective parts of their design, is how they took that swirling shape and turned it into something that would still read in just gray. Then we get into that reflection. This is where you step away and you take a look at your work and you say, how does it look? Is it being effective? Then you turn to your neighbor and believe it or not, on your exercise 114 handout, this is one of the mandated steps today. You're going to have to be friends with your neighbor. You'll have to turn them and say, what do you think of this particular logo? And they'll give you feedback. That's important. So you ask your neighbors or colleagues for their opinion. You receive that feedback, you let those ideas mature, and then you evolve your design. I had a student in here a couple years ago who was working on, on this particular thing, did her whole design process, went through, designed a logo that she thought was great, she was really excited about it, she tweaked it, she got it ready, then she turned to her neighbors and she said, what do you think of this logo? And they said, yeah, it's really nice, but maybe you should go look at the Beats logo. Spot on the Beats logo. She had no idea. It just kind of came to her. And so she did it that way. It looked great. But it, sometimes it takes that fresh perspective to have somebody else look at it and say, oh, that kind of looks like this one. And maybe you should think about it in a different way. So that's a mandated part of this design process today. You're going to talk to your neighbor about it. I love that one. Then we get to the presentation phase. You're distilling out those best ideas. You make the final version of your work. You get it to where it's ready to present to somebody. And then guess what? You present it to the client. 
Now, it's entirely possible you get to the point where you present it to the client, especially in a logo, and the client says, mm, don't like it. That's one of the challenges with graphic design and or logo design is that you're, you're doing it for somebody and they could very easily say they don't like it because a logo is really important. After you've distilled out those ideas, sometimes there's variants. I like this one for the Mall of America because the, the design is not as simple as just here's the first logo. That's the one on the upper left corner, but they have a whole bunch of variants of how that same ribbon could apply. They have a bunch of seasonal differences. So depending on which holiday we're close to, they might change it. Then they have a bunch of the patterns where this could be used as a backdrop. So the logo's been adapted for a bunch of different capacities. So it all ties together. It ties their work together. So it's not just the logo, it's a variant of the logo. Now obviously this is for a mall where you're going to see this logo repeated and being able to change it seasonally kind of makes sense and whatever. If you're doing a, a logo for your design practice, maybe you don't need to change it seasonally. But it's an interesting way of thinking about how does this really play out over the course of a particular business. Learn from others. What brands succeed and why? So I would argue that this is one of the most successful brandings that's ever been done. There's no text. There's nothing about it. Yet everybody knows exactly what brand that is. So something as simple as that in graphic shape can it be a complete identifier of an entire brand. And that's unique, and that's special, and that's part of what makes it so successful. And so can you do something in the same vein? Can you do something that makes you that successful from a branding standpoint? Typography. Sometimes you add type to a particular logo. So you want to think about what font should it be in. Maybe you didn't need to design your own font. That's certainly possible. Will the font go out of the sty style? <clears throat> Papyrus. <coughs> Sorry, struggling. Does it reflect your client or your business? Let's say you're doing something uh, you know, where it's very financial. Are you going to use Comic Sans? Nope, probably not. So you want to think about, is it appropriate? You may have to make your own to get the best results. That's the truth. So you might have to design your own font, design your own logo based on type um, to create that look. You could, of course, custom load any fonts. We can do that on these computers, and you can work with those custom load fonts. Remember, the little details really matter. The kerning, the space between the individual characters, all of that is really critical, especially when you have just a few letters in a particular logo. So here's a bunch of logos that are all text-based. So they're not graphic. They're just the text. And we rely on those texts, and we, of course, recognize them. It's always interesting because there's little things that, that you, you learn to discover. I, for, forever, I thought Disney ended in a P because I, I couldn't read the Y. I just couldn't see it. You want to think about stuff like that. FedEx. You guys all know there's something hidden in FedEx? Yeah. Right? So if you haven't seen this before, your mind is about to blow up. Okay, because, and you will never look at the FedEx logo the same way again because they hit a little Easter egg in there. It's about shipping things and moving packages from one place to another. Hidden a little arrow in there. That's good design. Can you weave one of those kinds of uh, little, little Easter eggs in? Let's say somebody came to you with a company. My company is called Dynamic Dust. How do you create a logo for that? This is one of those fake ones. It's not a real one. But it's an interesting challenge, coming up with a logo. There's something really clean and refreshing about this logo. Again, it's a made-up one. But it's unique, and it's interesting. You want to avoid these cliches. You cannot go into Word and grab a clip art image and call it your logo. Not going to work. Guess what? Everybody has the same clip art. No light bulbs for ideas, globes for international. Like these are all obvious things. You're not going to be unique. You know, the Nike logo isn't a shoe. That does not that's not how a Lego logo works. The other thing is you can't just copy somebody else's logo. You can't just say, "Oh, I really like the Amazon lo logo with the little smiley face and you do your name with a little smiley face underneath it." Not going to work. Right? Although Amazon is technically from A to Z, that's why there's an arrow. It's not really a smiley face. Anyway, 
Don't rely on somebody else's logo to make yours successful. It has to be unique. Then we get to output files. We're going to work today in 1500 pixel by 1500 pixel. That's the size that we're going to work in. I'm going to have you work in a square, though ultimately your logo could be cropped down, but that gives you kind of a, a generic space to work with. Generally, you're going to have something uh, that's 800 by 800 at 72 DPI. That's for web use. Um, you could have something even smaller. You know, in the, the upper uh, left corner of your browser, there's that tiny little icon that represents your, the website or whatever. I think it's 26 pixels by 26 pixels. You could do that for yours as well. Um, so you're thinking small scale, then you're also thinking big scale. The truth is, if you save the Illustrator file or at least a .eps of it, I'm going to ask you to save the Illustrator file today, you can, of course, because it's vector art, make it bigger. So it's not a problem to make it bigger afterward. Think about what it would look like in black and white, what it would look like in gray, and what it would look like uh, in color. Now maybe yours, your logo is just black and white. There's nothing wrong with that. But you want to think about how that plays out. So I'll flip through. These are a bunch of example uh, logos to get you thinking. That one's silly. I apologize, some of these are blurry. I need to go find higher resolution images. Another example of the sketching all the way through conceptualization. So this was a company called Jigsaw Internet. These are a bunch of the sketches, trying to figure out what it would look like. They did a little 3D model of these jigsaw puzzles and thought about it like, oh, this is good. This would be great in about mm, 2001. It would feel pretty good. Yeah, this is a cool logo. How would you adapt it for today? Yeah, maybe, maybe you'd thin it out a little bit. Maybe you'd do something like that. So you see evolution over time. And then how would it play out in a business card, et cetera. So you're thinking about where it would belong. So these are the 2018 logo design trends. Uh, I need to look up on Logo Lounge, I need to look up the 2019 logo design trends, see if they've published those yet. And they have little um, words that describe these. So this is tumbled. I guess it's because it has rounded corners. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. This is just a bunch of the examples of kind of the current design trends for what we're seeing. The parallelogram. The outline, so all of these have a fat outline around the outside. They call this one modern religion. This is actually very trendy. These kinds of logos are really trendy right now. Neo vintage. Black and white hipster. I love the names of them. The black and white hipster logo. The established logo. great place to look for logos is like microbreweries for beer logos. There's a lot of this kind of stuff because it's a trendy. They come in, they go out. So they're going to do something trendy for right now. Anyway, the burple. <laughs> I don't even know what burple means, but yeah, that's what it is. Gold. So that gold leaf behind. Remember, you just create the logo and then you do a place of the gold leaf into that logo. You guys have done that before. Uh, in Illustrator, you can do the same thing uh, in, or yeah, in InDesign. You've done it before in InDesign. You can do the same thing in Illustrator. The fatty fade, the big um, similar colors that are put together, the big bands of color. Linear fade. Field lines. Cut. I think a lot of these are really interesting. Thinking about how you can cut, especially this one down here. I think that one's done really well with that diagonal slicing through. So you could experiment with something like that. Switching from a sans serif back into a serif selectively. And then punctuation. Adding the extra little punctuation. So I'm not sure that that is necessarily the most effective thing. Okay, so I'm in Illustrator. I went ahead and I opened it so I don't have to do the login for it. Um, and now that it's open, I'm going to click on the Create New button here. 
And that will then bring up the new document window here. And when we get into these, we're going to be working today still in the print form, although technically we could work in the web size or in the mobile size. Uh, I'm going to stick with print for right now, and I'm going to come over here, and in my width, I'm going to go to pixels, and I'm going to type in 1500 by 1500. So I set it up in pixels. And I'm not worried about my margins or anything. The rest of that is all fine. We're also not worried about color space just yet. We'll go ahead and click on Create. And that then gives me this uh, page. Like I said, I wanted to work in a square today, but your eventual logo could be horizontal, it could be vertical, depending on what it is that you were working with. So, Part of the, the challenge today is working through how do we manipulate shapes. So last class we talked a lot about the pen tool and being able to freeform a particular shape uh, such that we could create whatever that shape was and then work with it. So I have that shape, I could fill it in you know, with black for example, I could take the stroke and make it nothing uh, and now that can start to be a shape. You guys all did that. But what happens if we want to create more complex shapes? So I'm going to show you how to work with a, a tool palette called the Pathfinder Tools. And I can access those by going up to the Window menu and choosing Window and then Pathfinder, which is right here. By the way, Pathfinder is available in, in InDesign as well. So we've, we're going to work with it in Illustrator, but it still shows up in InDesign once you know how to work with it. It's kind of like the pen tool. Once you know how to work with it in one, you'll be able to work with it in the other. So. I'll start first by working with um, just the rectangle tool, the, the, the rectangle tool. I'm going to go ahead and as I start to create this shape, I'm going to hold down shift to keep it in proportion and I will create nice, a nice big block here. I want to fill in that color with a different color. So my fill color is currently at black, but I'm going to pick a different color. I'm going to say maybe an orange, something like that. And again, you're, you're, you can do whatever you want with it. Now, what the Pathfinder tool does is it allows us to, to control how certain shapes interact with each other. So I have that rectangle. I'm going to use the star tool, not because this is going to be an attractive logo, but because it will illustrate my point. So I'm going to work with the star tool right now, and I'm going to put a star in a different color. That's just such an awful color conversation. I can't do it. Um, and I will put that over the top of this shape, like that. So I have the square behind, and I have the star in front. With those arranged, I'm going to look at the Pathfinder tools here, and I'm going to walk you through what's happening on these various tools. And then we'll get into creating some more complicated logos from there. So the first one here, under Shape Modes, combines the two shapes together. So if I have this and I have this, I need to select them both. So I'll hold down shift so that I can select both shapes. And if I click this first shape mode, it will combine the two shapes together to make one shape. So the tips of the star now extend past my square. So it's taken those and it's made them into one shape. Now where would this be relevant, for example? Let's say that I had a shape back here. I'm going to work in the margins here. Let's say I had this shape and then I had another shape like that. And I wanted these two shapes to become one shape. I could take those two shapes and I could join them into one shape and they make one shape out of it. So it, the star example might not be the best example of it, but that's how I would go about creating a more complicated shape. I could start with two different pieces and then end up putting them together. So that's the first shape mode. It's this one here. Uh, they call it Unite. It's kind of like a Boolean union where we're, we're joining two things together. So the next one here is to subtract the front. So in this scenario, if I were to take these two shapes, and choose this option here, minus front, it's going to cut out the star from the background shape. So I don't, I don't have the star anymore. That's gone away. And my background shape 
is all one shape, but it has that star being cut out of it. The other important thing here is that that piece is transparent. So if I were to take this This is transparent, so it's clear. The part that I cut out is clear as part of the shape. I'm trying to illustrate that. Okay? Boy, you guys really can't see that very well. Um, let's see here. There, you can see that better. Okay, so that's, that's transparent, what's been cut out. So let me go ahead and back up here for a second. There we go. And now we'll experiment with the third option. So I'll select both shapes again. This option will keep the part that intersects. So I'll end up just with that part of the star. So it's clipped one off the other, and we end up with the, the, the intersection of the two. And then the last option is to get rid of the part where they overlap, but to leave the part where it extends out. So again, these are all different variants on how you would combine shapes together. Go back here for a second. Below the shape modes, we have the pathfinders. And the pathfinders are in the same vein as the shape modes. The difference is they tend to keep the various parts. So in this one, divide, I'm going to end up with three separate parts. So when I click divide, and I have to use the, uh, the direct selection tool to break them apart, there's one piece, there's the second piece, and then these are the third pieces. So it's taken the shapes, and everywhere that they've overlapped, it's chopped them up. Let me undo those for a second. There we go. Here, going to, they call it trim. It's going to cut the background from the foreground. So this one in front is going to maintain its shape, but the background is going to be cut into individual pieces. Next one here. Uh, this is going to merge them. Um, they become one object, but they're still, if we went in with the direct select tool, uh, we could go in and, and edit and or move the individual pieces. It's very similar. There's just a subtle difference between how they end up um, in the end result. This one here is the crop. And so in this scenario, it's cropped to just this particular piece. The difference here is that the background is being cropped to the foreground. So we're taking the shape of the background and we're cutting it down to what the shape of the foreground is. Less common. Most, the most common pathfinder is this divide where we keep all the component pieces. Last one here is outline, which gives us just the outlines of the shapes. I actually don't have any um, outline or stroke color assigned to it, so we're not even seeing anything. If I gave it a stroke color, then we'd be able to see the outlines there. Go back here for a second. All right, last one is minus the back. So let me select, hold on, black arrow, let me select those two shapes, and we'll go to minus the back, where it cut the back off of the front. Again, not the most attractive end result, but I wanted to walk through what each of those Pathfinder tools actually does. Okay, so now how does this apply to a particular logo? So obviously the star is not the most attractive logo in, in, in the world, so let's play around with some different um, ideas. So I'll start here with my same square, but I'll go ahead and I'll take the text tool and I'll add some type. So let's go ahead and come over here. Oops, you know what I'm going to do, instead of a text box, I'm going to do a single line of text. So I'll just click once, and then we'll take that text, and we need to go over and change font and size. Let's up the size here. And we'll use... my first, the first letter of my first name here. This needs to really be a lot bigger, so let's do like uh, 500. No, even bigger than that. Let's try 1,000. There we go. And so I could take this letter, for example, and I could push it so that it's right down there. And then I could create outlines from this. We did this in um, Illustrator or in InDesign, where we took the text, we went up to Type, 
and we said create outlines. That creates an actual shape out of it. Then I could take these two pieces. Oops, that text box needs to go away. There we go. I could take these two pieces and I could subtract the front and I'd end up with uh, that letter there. Now if I wanted to manipulate this a little bit more, instead of subtracting the front, let me move this down a little bit so that that actually intersects here. I could go into the divide. Oops, I have to select them both first. And then I could go in and I could, with the direct select tool, the white arrow, I could delete this, but I could also delete these other pieces there and there. And I could end up with part of a logo where I cut out that piece. Now maybe I like it, maybe I don't. This is where we keep evolving things. Maybe I want this to turn into more of a parallelogram. Remember that was one of the design trends. So I could say, okay, let me go ahead and draw on here a diagonal shape. Like that. And we could use the same techniques where I selected these two and I said uh, subtract the front and I could cut that particular piece off. Maybe I want, uh, I wanted it, and again, I'm evolving as I go. I don't know what I'm creating right now. Uh, so maybe I like that, maybe I don't. This is where layers might come in. So we've worked with layers in InDesign. Um, we can work with layers in Illustrator as well. Let me create a new layer. I'm on layer two here. Let's take layer one and we'll turn it off and I'll do something else. So this is again part of that, that process. So let's start with, in this scenario, oops, let me be on layer two. Start with a smaller square, maybe something like that. I'm going to click on the pen tool and add a control point right there to my line. And then I could take it with the direct select tool, the white arrow, and I could pull that down. I'm holding down shift to keep it in the straight line such that I end up with something like this. I could then, um, let's see, let's do a, I'm going to do another little rectangle here. Maybe about like that. For our purposes, I'll change the color just so you could see it a little bit better. So there's that. I'm going to copy this, control C and then control V, that creates another one. And I'm just going to drop these together into the middle. So just like with InDesign, if I set my first shape on one end and my second shape, and then I use the align tools. So in the same window as Pathfinder, the next one over would be a line. There's a line. I could say, let's take all of these, all those little shapes that I copied. Let's make my key object that first one. Again, it highlights for me. And then I could say, okay, let's line them all to the center. Okay, now they're the same. Then I can also, I don't need the key object anymore. I can distribute the objects along their centers such that the spacing is even on all of them. So I didn't spend too much time when I did the copies and paste because I knew I could use the align tools to create that even space. Now that all those are even, I actually need to move it down a little bit. There we go, sounds pretty good. I could take all of those shapes and I could switch over to the Pathfinder tools and I could say let's minus the front and I'd end up creating those ribbons. Do so you see how I did that? I took the shape, then I cut it with the other shape. Now I could go through and I could make subtle changes to each one of these individual pieces to change the color. So if I started, say, I'm going to use the direct select when I do this, that one will be the first one. I could go in and change the color for this one, and I could just make it a little bit darker. Uh, let's see here. Let's go like that. Not enough. Let's 
anyway, you guys get the idea where I could work through and I could create that, that gradient or that fade uh, of lines. So that's another option. Now, same thing I could do here. I could put a piece of text over the top of this if I wanted to. So maybe this time I would do, oops, let me do an A. I have the A selected here. I'm going to go to Type, Create Outlines, place this right over the top of it. Maybe about like that. And I could say, okay, let's take all of these. And once again, I'm going to subtract the one that's in front. Oops. I might have to group these together first. Nope, it doesn't like me. No, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I'll go into divide. Sometimes when you when it's just not working the way you want it to, and then I could go in and I could delete all of these pieces. Now, in this scenario, I have all of those in black. I could go up to the select menu and I could say select and then same fill color. That would select all the black pieces and then I could get rid of all the black pieces in that scenario. So if I'm using the same colors, that sometimes is a good strategy. Likewise, if I set up this gradient going down and I wanted to roll back the other way, I could take each one of these pieces like that and then use the eyedropper tool to select that color to match. And then I could select these pieces, oops, there, there, and there. Eyedropper tool and select the next color up. There, there, there. Eyedropper and select whatever the next color up is, et cetera. So I can use that to, to copy and paste particular uh, parts of the logo. So I'm not saying in any capacity that this is attractive. I'm just trying to show you different options for how you might go about doing something. Okay, so there was an option. Let me create another one here like that. So let's see, what else? Um, if I wanted to create one of those high quality parallelograms, I could start by creating the rectangle. So create the rectangle like that. I'm going to switch colors. I'm tired of looking at that brown color. Let's pick a blue. I could then use direct select, the white arrow, and I could select the two endpoints on this one side, and I could then pull them up a certain amount, whatever that amount would be, like that. Then uh, let's say I wanted to fold over one of these corners. I could create another shape. I'm going to do this with the pen tool. Okay, so I create that shape. For clarity purposes, I will change the color of that shape so that you guys can see it there. Then I'll take these two again, and same thing here, I'm going to uh, divide the pieces, which will let me go in, get rid of the excess, so that piece. This is my corner. I need to flip it over so that it's folded down. So I would right click on it and go to arrange uh, sorry, right click transform and we're going to reflect. We'll reflect horizontal first. I'll say OK. Then I'm going to right click and go to arrange, sorry, transform, reflect, and we're going to reflect it vertically as well. And then I'm going to line that piece up like that and it's going to look like that one piece is folded over. Probably a little hard for you guys to see it in purple. We'll go more, oops. I mean like that. Now you can see that as it's folded over. I could then do the same thing where I add text. Now in this scenario, it's a little bit more challenging to add the text um, because I want it to be on the same angle. So I'm going to go in to the pen tool and I'm going to create a line that is along the same angle here. So we'll say like that. Then I'm going to go into the type tool, but instead of picking the regular type tool, I'm going to type on path. 
And when I click on that, I'm going to actually be able to go on the path and then type on that angle on the path. And again, that might be uh, something you want to do. It might be something you don't want to do. So I could do, say, my last name. But I'm going to need to change the size. There we go. And then maybe I'd move this like that. And then same thing here, where I take my, my text, and then I go up to Type, and then Create Outlines. And in this scenario, I'm just going to match that as my fill color so that it's filled in like that. OK, so again, all of these are just strategies for how you would go about creating some kind of a, a logo. Make sense? So today is about Pathfinder tool, experimenting with the Pathfinder tool, and then working to combine shapes together. I have a little thing in here about color palettes. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about color palettes next class, so I'm not overly worried about color palettes. We'll get to that. Um, spend time creating the, the actual logos. I'm playing around with those. Um, remember in part three, I ask you to talk to your neighbor. I really mean you need to talk to your neighbor. That's a required step as part of this. Uh, and get some information from them and see, see what's working for them, etc. cetera. Um, when you're done, you're going to export your work as a PNG. So let's say that this was the file that I ultimately wanted to be my logo right there. I'd go into uh, File, and then Export, and then Export As. And we're going to look down here, and we're going to choose a PNG. The reason that I'm asking you to choose a PNG is it will preserve the uh, transparency of the background. So we're going to work with a PNG, and I would call this logo or whatever. And I'm going to put it on the desktop for right now. I'll say export, and then I can choose what my resolution would be. Notice that it automatically cropped to the size of my object. If I wanted to have the whole artboard, if I wanted the full piece, as opposed to cropping to my object, um, when I went to export, export as, I would check this box to use the artboard. That'll define the, the page size. Otherwise, it'll scale to your objects. That is actually a good point. Even if my object here was larger than the page, so I went off the page here, and I went to File, Export, Export As. If I didn't check Use Artboards, it will still crop to the size of my objects. So it's not, like InDesign automatically cuts at the page. Illustrator doesn't cut at the page unless you check that box for export uh, with your artboard. That'll define the page. So I'm just pointing that out for you. Uh, for your purposes today, you'll increase the resolution to 300. And then you'll go ahead and say OK. And it will then save your work. Remember, you can, with these various objects, you can choose to give yourself an outline color. So let's say that I wanted this to have a white outline around it. I could change my stroke to have a white outline around it as well. So I have flexibility there as well. I just forgot to mention um, that we could play around with the strokes. Uh, logo Lounge, I think that's what it is. Let me see if I can pull it up right now. Yeah, Logo Lounge. And then if you click on Trends, Maybe, there we go. There we go, there, our 2019 logo trend report. I need to update my lecture to have the 2019 uh, trend report. And they're pretty good. They actually give a lot more detailed explanations of what these are. Uh, but you can go through and you can see what their, their current design trends are, which is, which is a good place to start, actually, uh, as you look through. Okay, So that's Logo Lounge, and then click on their trends.